Hello and welcome. I'm Sabrina Halper. I'm an investor at HOF Capital and the host of this podcast. Today on the show, we have Enrique Dubogra. Enrique is 26 years old. He's from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and he is the co-founder and co-CEO of Brex. Brex is a $12.3 billion fintech company, which is essentially a credit card and bank for startups. I think we're going to have a fascinating conversation today, so listen in and I hope you enjoy. Hello, Henrique. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. really appreciate it. I would just love to get into it. And I think it's important to start from the beginning of your journey into tech, which starts at a very young age. So you grew up in Sao Paulo, right? Yeah. And how was that experience growing up there? Um, well, you know, I, 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 I usually say I grew up in Sao Paulo, but actually the state of Sao Paulo, um, I moved around a lot and um, it was great. I think like, look, it's it's a very, you know, it was the countryside. It wasn't the big city. So I lived, you know, in, um, I wouldn't say it's the middle of nowhere because there's a lot more middle of nowhere in Brazil than where I grew up. But uh, I would say it's very far from, uh, you know, a big city where tech was going on or business was going on. It was just a, a regular um, small town and I think what what happened to me was that I, I had this life in real life and I had this life online that I had all my online friends and my online games and my online everything so I for me I felt that my main community my main friend group was actually people I met online instead of my you know my, my crew from school and what first got you into that online community and tech was that like video games were you gaming yeah, exactly. So I, I used to um, play this game though, you know, I wanted to play this game as a paid game and I figured out if I learned how to code, I could play it for free. So I found an online community that was building a pirate version of this game and I became part of it. Um, and this is a community in which, you know, when I was going to regular school, um, doing sports was really valued, right? Really good soccer. Soccer was the thing in Brazil. That was the the cool thing to do. And in this community online, coding was really cool, you know? Um, so I, I decided to learn how to code and, you know, uh, around there. Definitely. And do you feel like you could get along in both communities, like the real life community where you had to be like an athlete and a jock and then the online community, or did you find a lot more comfort in that online world? Definitely a lot better in the online one. I would say, mm -hmm. especially growing up, I felt a little bit like an alien at school. Um, you know, because like I wasn't even that good at school. So it's not like I was the traditional nerd who got like all <laughs> A's, you know, like I was just like, you know, not super popular and at the same time not getting A's, you know, so. <laughs> and how <laughs> I, did you. The online community was better. And how did you teach yourself how to code? Um, I think just online, you know, like there was books you could download online and then kind of trial and error. And I just really, really wanted it. Right. Like, you know, recently I found out maybe years ago that I'm, I have pretty strong ADHD and mm. um, that explained a lot of like why I couldn't pay attention in class and I didn't have great grades but at the same time a, a big thing about ADHD is like you have this ability to hyper focus so in something you're interested in so I was able to stay 12 hours straight just like coding and learning how to code because they're so interested in it wow wow and then your first venture in tech was how old and what was it um my first i first got into startups because i i um started working at the startup because uh okay. i you know after i, I after i tried i built this pirate version of this game who got which got really popular and then i got some legal notifications saying I was breaking some sort of patents i didn't really know what patents were but my mom got super upset and told me to shut everything off and then from that point you know i didn't really know what to do with my life so i started doing some regular stuff you know i found a, <laughs> found a girlfriend like i started watching tv shows and i started watching this tv show called chuck that was a computer hacker and programmer mm. that was you know became my idol and because he saved the world through code and hacking and all that and he went to stanford so i got obsessed into getting into stanford and when looking for other brazilians who had gotten into stanford to help me with the process i found this one that was graduating and he had he was starting a startup out of Stanford. Mm. And then we did this deal in which I would code for him for free in exchange. He would teach me the Stanford application process and write me a recommendation letter. Wow. Um, and the seven essays. I remember there was like a million essays we had to write. Uh, a million essays. Exactly. Um, and so that's kind of how I got originally into tech and startups was by working for this guy for like a year. 
And then after a year, I left and I tried to start my own company of a couple of friends I had met online. That was an education company that helped other Brazilian students with the U.S. application process. Um, and that's kind of how I started, you know, building companies. But that one failed miserably. And then your, your next one did not fail miserably, which was Pagarme. And you started that with your current co-founder, Pedro. Um, how did There's you actually Pedro two in between, get to- but Wow. Oh, there was two other failed this. ones in, in between. Um, yeah, so the this was the first one, uh, the education one. And we tried another education one to help, you know, get scholarships for Brazilians who want to study abroad. We're definitely in that niche. Uh, also didn't work. And then we tried a dating one called Ask Me Out, which we won a hackathon for. And we tried to launch a company that was like Tinder, but instead of geolocation, it was Facebook friends. You could like and match your Facebook friends. Um, so that was kind of like our idea in 2012. And, and then Pagarme was the next one, which thank God worked out because I was tired Got of failing it. startups at this point. So you had tried ed tech, you tried dating, and then you're like, let's go into some like a good money making field, sort of like fintech. Yeah, we didn't know it was that good money making when we started. You know, it was kind of random a little bit, but I'm very happy but and lucky. I got it. How how did you and Pedro pick like this this as the idea to pursue Pagarme, which was processing payments, essentially the stripe of Brazil? Yeah, so um, I had had to implement payments in this dating app, and I thought it was a horrible experience. And then Pedro was actually working as a programmer at a payments company. So he kind of understood how, how things work. So we got our heads together and say, hey, let's build a, a better version of this. Um, so that's kind of how it got it. It was a little bit random. And then you guys processed over a billion dollars in payments, but eventually you realized like, this isn't your ultimate project that you want to devote more years of your life to and you wanted to go to college. Um, so you go to Stanford and you're there for less than six months. And I'm just curious, like when you get to Stanford, I'm sure the process was probably kind of seamless because you had already started this huge company. So it wasn't too hard to get in or too hard to get visas. But did you feel like you could make friends? Like, could you relate to these other 18 year old kids when you had already like built a massive business and tried and failed many times? You were sort of in a different place or did you did you feel like? Yeah, I think um, it was hard. You know, honestly, because we had this like super adult life, right? Like we were, you know, company had 150 people. We were managing all these responsibilities. All of our friends were much older. You know, we were really, you know, we made some money. Like we, we, we were living this like very, very adult life. And we got to Stanford and, you know, our roommates were um, 18 and coming to college for the first time and experiencing life for the first time. So we ended up becoming friends with the people who are like graduating or just graduated because they were kind of like more of our age group. And also like, I think international kids, um, because, you know, had a similar experience to us growing up. So um, it, we didn't make good friends at Stanford, but it wasn't exactly with the same, with my, like, in your year. yeah, yeah. My, 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 my year. Totally. And I mean, looking back now, do you feel like there's anything that those six months at Stanford did give you or continues to give you today or? Um, well, I, I made very close friends that I'm, I'm friends till, till today. Um, I... I think that it also gave us the safety net to be able to explore different ideas. So, you know, when we started Brex, we tried a a VR idea before. And like, I think the freedom to not care was because like, hey, worst case scenario, like we don't need to find an idea now. We'll we'll just go back to Stanford, right? Like it was a, it's a, it's a a pretty great safety net. Definitely. And the idea behind Brex what was what was it inspired by you guys had gotten into y combinator you and pedro you knew you wanted to start something and then how did it pivot from a vr company to um a corporate credit card so the reason we started a vr company was because we wanted we were tired of fintech we're like mm-hmm. we're done with fintech you know these banks these regulations so complicated you know like Oh my God, we're, we're done. And then we wanted to build something innovative and like in the bleeding edge of technology, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and all these people we idolized growing up. And, yeah. you know, VR seemed like that, you know, this thing in the bleeding edge of technology. But a few months in, we were like, a few, yeah, like maybe two months in, we're like, we have absolutely no idea what we're doing, you know? Because I think our initial thing, well, well, we figure out payments in Brazil, you know, VR, but VR is much harder. Yeah. Um, so then we pivoted and we looked back and, you know, one of our Stanford friends gave us this feedback, which is like, look, it's not only about product market fit, right? It's about like this, you know, founder idea fit, right? Like why, 
why are you better positioned than the next other two smart Stanford kids to start this idea and this company? And, you know, that's kind of where we went back to fintech and banking and credit cards, which was something we were already working on for a long time. And during Y Combinator, we saw that all these companies had raised a ton of money and couldn't get corporate credit cards. And that's kind of how we got the idea. Definitely. Could you just explain a bit for people that kind of don't know the space? Like, what is the essential problem that Brex is fixing? Why can't startups get corporate credit cards? Why can't they just go to Visa or Citibank and... Yeah, for sure. So, you know, obviously the market's evolving. And when we started in 2017, there's a different market than today, right? But back in 2017, um, there wasn't, if you had raised millions of dollars, five, six, seven, ten million dollars, and you wanted to get a corporate card, the only way they would give one to you is if you had a great FICO or if you had already a company that existed for many years and had was profitable, right? They That's the only way, that, they only knew how to underwrite you know, normal business. Cause it makes sense. If you're starting a bakery, either you have a great FICO and they'll give you a personal loan or you need to have a bakery that's been, you know, operating and profitable for a few years. So they get comfortable to give you credit for the next few years. And I think, you know, venture and tech was just a new thing. And, you know, the, the banks weren't adapted to, 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 to that model. And it was really hard for them to adapt to that model as well. So we allow them to have a, a credit card with no personal guarantees a much higher credit limit than anyone else would in five minutes. Got it. And um, why do you think banks weren't innovating to capture this new market the way that you guys were? Because banks are full of good ideas. Actually, for a long time, you know, a lot of smart people from, you know, Stanford or, or, you know, any other good school, they went to banking and they had all these good ideas. But the problem with banks is they have these systems, these legacy technology systems that were built 30 years ago. So it's really hard for a bank to build anything new because they have this core infrastructure, right? And, you know, for uh, to build what we wanted to do, we were doing, it's, it's really hard for them. I think that's one thing. The second thing is, especially when we started now, as we're bigger, right? People are noticing, but it just seemed like such a niche, right? Even when we were starting to raise money for the first time, it's like, how can this be a big business credit card for startups? How many startups are even there, you know? So I think that the banks were like, yeah, this is just not interesting enough for us. Now, obviously, all that's changing, but that's probably the reason early on. I imagine there was still a lot of financial regulation that you had to work around. What, did you feel like that made it harder for you to launch or was that the most difficult process just building this infrastructure from scratch? I think that it was the three things. I think like, you know, we said Brex, the, the hard part is the integration between product and technology, legal and compliance and finance, right? There's innovation in the three things. And I think, you know, what Pedro and I were particularly good at is understanding deeply those three things and being able to, you know, create a product based on that. Definitely. I want to get into fundraising. You're sort of famous for your ability to fundraise and it's helped Brex immensely in the sense that you've been able to hire the top talent and grow very quickly. What do you think has made you so good at it? What are some key tactics that you would offer and, you know, advise other founders to follow? There's very different styles and people who successfully fundraise. I do think is an important skill um, because, you know, especially in fintech, like raising money is a core part of the business. It is a capital intensive business. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important. For me, I would say there's three things that I would give as advice for my personal fundraising you know, kind of way of doing and other people run in different ways. But my my way of doing it is actually building real relationships with investors mm -hmm. um, and not treating it as a transactional nature. I think a lot of people I know and very smart and good at fundraising people. They basically like, look, I'm super focused on building a company, a product. I have no time for investors. Then whenever there's a deal, I go, I raise money and then I go back. Right. I have a different model in which I'm constantly catching up and building a relationship and getting to know people. Um, and I think that's hugely helpful, right? If someone meets you in January, you tell them about your business, they keep track of your progress for some while, right? And you're building that really, because if you meet someone and you're asking them for money at that moment, it just changes the nature of the relationship versus just getting to know each other. And eventually there's a transaction, you know, and you're already six months in, right? Definitely. And I also think that, you know, if a founder is going to give themselves one month to raise around, they're going to limit themselves on maybe the quality and, you know, who they could get in by setting these, these strict boundaries rather than, you know, meeting people when the time is right. 
Um, on that point, I'm curious, you had some amazing early backers like Peter Thiel and, you know, Y Combinator and having such high caliber people believe in you and be available to you to offer advice. How did you decide, you know, when to take their input and when to follow your, your own gut on decisions? You know, it's a great question. Um, in the end of the day, right, like the relationship that we have with our board and investors is one that we want their input so but we have the accountability so we have to make the decision right so we go in and you know take their input and the, and the more senior the person is right like we notice that very junior investors they're very certain that what they're saying is true mm. um and actually the more senior and experienced investors the more nuanced they are it's like look this worked for this situation but i've seen other situations in which it didn't work so there's a lot of nuance in building a company um and I think that, you know, we, we take it as input and try to understand our situation and make a call. But at the end of the day, the call is ours because the accountability, if it goes wrong, is also ours, right? So um, it's, Definitely. It's, it's always our, our, our decision. And one decision I'm curious about whether you got any pushback on is you mentioned it earlier, but your decision to simplify the message of what Brex was to just be a credit card for startups. Because I think doing that was probably kind of avant-garde at the time. And I'm curious if there were people pushing you to, to expand that, like say, no, it could also be for small businesses. It can be for, you know, anyone that wants to grow. I'm curious, like, was that an obvious decision? Now it's paid off immensely, but at the time, were you, were you nervous about narrowing it like that or no? I think at the time it was an obvious decision. Hmm. Um, I wish we had stuck with that. Um, I think as we launch more products and we launch more markets and we launch more everything, our message got a lot more confusing and, you know, and we're, we're working to, to fix that. But like, um, I think that was a lot of the, the but we, we didn't have any reason why not to do that. If that makes sense. Like our, we, our product literally didn't work for anything else. So, um, it, we could only underwrite startups. So like, why would we not yeah, do that? I guess, um, definitely. Which is not true for a lot of other products in which, you can serve a lot of customers. You're just choosing to start startups. We literally couldn't serve anything else at a time. Totally. So you actually knew that like startups were your customer and the growth came in like the ways you could expand to be eventually a complete like financial toolkit for them. I vividly remember like when I went to Stanford, whenever I would go into San Francisco, I'd see like Brex billboards everywhere. And it was like a credit card for startups. And it was such like a catchy line that really stuck with me. Um, so you guys also had some really like narrowed marketing where you're like, we're hitting San Francisco, we're, we're going to the hub of where the startups are. And so I, I really respect that. I think it, it was like a great tactic. Um, so today you have launched Brex Cash, Brex Bank, you've expanded the products that you offer. Like what's your vision for Brex in 10 or 20 years? Yeah, so um, our, our vision in the long term is to be what we call a financial operating system for the next generation of businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, we want to be the office of the CFO, this, the place that the CFO goes to understand what's happening and manage the entire financial part of the business the same way, you know, if you're like a chief revenue officer, right, and you're managing the customers, you go to Salesforce, or um, if you want to manage your entire infrastructure, you go to AWS, right, we want to be that for the finance team um, for, for Inbrox. Got it. And then you have been able to make the life of startups so much easier by creating this type of credit card. Do you think just from knowing the space well, do you think, you know, personal consumers will ever get that luxury of being able to make a bank account on their phone and in five minutes have a credit card? Or do you, do you never see that happening? I think they will. It probably won't be with Rex. Um, yeah. You know, I think our, our vision is already big enough for businesses. Consumer adds a whole other layer of complexity. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at neobanks, you know, like Robinhood, for example, Chime and others, I think that that's the direction that the world is going for sure. Definitely. So you feel sort of comfortable sticking in like the B2B marketplace just because it's technically so much bigger with payments than B2C anyway. Well, I don't know if it's bigger, but, you know, it is where we are and where we we're passionate about, right? Like not that we're, we're not passionate about consumers, but we're just yeah. so inspired by helping businesses. Definitely. And you guys have grown so much. You are serving over 10,000 customers. You have over 600 employees. And I just want to ask you, 
like as an individual leader, I imagine that has taken a lot of work. It's been a fast change from probably working in a very close knit tight team where you know everyone well to, you know, leading employees that maybe you've only gotten to meet once or twice. How have you had to, you know, shift the way that you lead? Is there anything you've had to, you know, relearn or teach yourself? Absolutely. I think um, the, the job of, you know, the CEO changes a lot. And Pedro and I, we have an amazing co-CEO relationship in which um, we're very complimentary. You know, we, we, we split the role in external and internal. He's the internal CEO. I'm the external CEO. And, um, and what is that? What does that mean exactly? Yeah. So uh, what it means is uh, for Pedro, he runs, you know, the business day to day. So he runs all the executives, um, and, you know, runs the leadership meetings, all hands, you know, execution. And I, I do all the external stuff. So fundraising, PR, you know, business development, enterprise customers, you know, everything that someone needs to meet the CEO of Rex, you know, that's me day to day in the company, Pedro runs everything. So um, we have this, you know, amazing working relationship. And I think the thing that both of us learned over time is that the most important thing about the CEO job is being authentic. I think when you start, you look at someone like Jeff Bezos and you're like, I wanna be like Jeff Bezos. Well, what does Jeff Bezos do? Let me do like that. Um, and the reality is that there's like, like a, a hundred different ways of being a good CEO. Yeah, the most important thing is being a CEO that's authentic to yourself. You're never going to be like Jeff Bezos if you're not his type of personality and his experience. You know, like there's, um, you're never going to be something that's very different than yourself. Yeah. Uh, so try to embrace to be the best version of yourself as a CEO instead of trying to, you know, replicate some, some other successful person. Totally. And what do you think you're like as a CEO? Like if I was a Brex employee, what would I, I would be like Enrique is. Um, you'll, 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 you'll definitely find me very external, externally mm -hmm. focused, you know, versus like very internally focused. I definitely, you know, talk a lot to customers, to partners, to investors, and, you know, have a, a great feel. I think Pedro is a lot more internally focused. You know, he knows what's happening everywhere in the company in the most, most minutious detail. If we were to switch places, we would do terrible job, you know, um, so uh, it, it needs just to be authentic. It's very cool that you and Pedro met so young and have been able to keep like such a, I mean, productive and healthy co-founder relationship as you guys have grown and gone through multiple businesses. It's And you met online. So it's a stroke of luck and an amazing partnership. Um, what do you think have been some of the hardest challenges What's one of the hardest challenges that, you know, you have had to deal with on your founder journey and building Brex thus far? Was there a specific moment that really stuck out as, you know, super stressful or um, where you weren't sure you guys were going to make it or something like that? Um, Coke was really stressful. I think, you know, um, Brex was definitely not in the category of companies that was COVID helped at all. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't the ones that COVID killed, but we weren't the ones that COVID helped either. And, you know, 2019, you we were on the Katera, we, we grew so much, you know, everything was going great. And then COVID hit and, you know, we decreased for like a month and that never had happened anything close. We're growing like 20, 30% every month. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that that was uh, pretty stressful. We had to do a layoff, which is probably the worst day of my life. Um, and I think that that was probably a very stressful moment in time, Brex. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that for some reason I would have expected that COVID would have been good for Brex because tech was doing so well, but I guess- Well, that's three months later, right? Like that's June, yeah. July, August, but mm -hmm. March and April were- <laughs> No one knew how it was gonna shake out. And so yeah, exactly. everyone, had to, everyone had to prepare. And another question is in this current market moment where there's like a lot of talk of like, you know, are we going into, is America going into a recession? Like what's happening? How are you viewing this moment? Like, how are you thinking of preparing, um, you know, Brax for what's ahead? You know, like if anyone knew what was going to happen, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they'd be doing a lot of things differently. So it's, it's hard to tell. Um, I think that one thing is just validates our always our idea of just having a lot of cash. I think Brex today has over a billion dollars in cash in our balance sheet. Um, so we can weather a lot of storms. Um, and I think that in the moments in which everyone is 
uh, going defensive, if you're if you have a strong balance sheet, it's it's the time to to go offensive, right? So I think that's how we're we're thinking about it. Definitely, you guys have set yourself up really well, which is why I've you know heard you say in other interviews that's one reason that you believe in sort of fundraising more than you might need in that immediate time frame. This is sort of a perfect example of that. Um, and you know, I mean, fintech is such a growing industry. There's so many different ways it can go and do you see any ways that you think, you know, thoughts on how blockchain technologies will interact with the space or maybe even eventually interact with, you know, Brex's product? Yeah, for sure. I think um, there's a lot of different ways. Like blockchain um, is a super interesting technology. And even at Brex, you know, there's like some internal projects that we're building our own I wouldn't say we're building our own blockchain. That's probably a step too far, but we're using a lot of the concepts of the blockchain technology to ensure, for example, that it's impossible for, even if we get hacked for balances to be changed, right? For someone internally mm -hmm. to steal money, right? Like I think the technology, you know, should be used by fintechs um, to ensure security and safety, right? Even outside of the crypto world, um, which is something that we're, we're, we're doing. But I think if you look at, um, crypto itself, you know, I think if crypto were really successful, I think we would be in a great spot, actually, because in the end of the day, someone still needs to have a relationship with the merchants, right? And, you know, dealing with their accounting and, you know, helping with all the things that we help them around expense management and bill pay and giving them an instrument to pay, right? There's, there's all these things that still need to happen, even if the, the underlying currency changes and the underlying rails change. Um, that I think we would be able to adapt a lot faster than the traditional banks would. Yeah, definitely. You guys are in a great position for that. And I mean, coming from Brazil, a country that has seen a lot of, you know, inflation over the years, do you personally like really believe in, in crypto and like the, you know, what it can offer a country like Brazil or how do Absolutely. you think about it? I'm, a, I'm, I'm very bullish on it. Um, I think that, you know, um, if you grew up in the US, you're never thinking about the value of the dollar relative to other currencies. That's like not something that goes through your thought process. You know, you, you, like, do you know, like, you know, if you ask an average person, hey, do you know what's the conversion of a dollar to any other currency in the world? No one knows. Um, versus in Brazil, no. you always know what the dollar is, you know, like, and uh, <laughs> you all like, if you ask anyone, like, what's the dollar, like people have like, maybe they get like 10, 20% wrong, but like they yeah. have a good. I actually good did <laughs> just look it up. I think it's like 0.2 of the dollar, right? Yeah, roughly. But that is, that is, you're right. I've never ha had that framework of how I'm looking on like the American dollar. Um, and I listened to an interview you did where you said that was, you know, one reason that you chose to start Brex in the US, like probably one of many is that even for fundraising, you could, you know, fundraise like the amount of money you need and you have this cash and then all of a sudden it could a third in value if something happened, you know, like with the government. And so that, yeah, that's, that's a hard situation. And I wonder if, if like full scale implementation of crypto might, might help that and might even help like the the Brazilian um, flourishing sort of startup ecosystem. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I think that if you have volatility and inflation built into your economy anyway, crypto doesn't sound that scary. Yeah. Looking forward, are there other areas of fintech that you're building Brax? And I mean, it's a huge company. I don't think you have any time to do anything else, but that like other areas of fintech that you would say are ripe for innovation, other areas that, you know, there's not that much tech there yet. I mean, fintech, I mean the financial industry or the current yeah. systems. Well, I think there's still a lot of opportunity in global. Um, mm -hmm. I think the world's going a lot more global and, you know, there's some big companies. If you look at like a lot of the value of a company like Stripe comes from the fact that with one integration, you can accept payments in multiple countries at once, right? Like the entire world is going more global people are traveling right like and now that we're hiring remotely in all these different places i think there's a lot of technology and a lot of opportunity in, in making the world smaller from a global perspective definitely and i know brex like you now have i believe the majority of your of your workforce is now remote am i right about that um 
Yeah, so we don't require anyone to go to an office. We still have a few offices, but you're free to go or not go as you wish. So do you, you don't have, do you have a strong opinion on productivity as it relates to remote work or you sort of, I imagine you would want your employees to have like the best life they can. And if that means remote for them, then that's what they get. Yeah, I think, look, um, you know, I can talk the whole podcast about this, but like, uh, I feel that we're in the worst version of remote that we're ever going to have. Um, Mm -hmm. it's only going to get better from here, you know? Uh, just in March, Rex is conducting, I think, six to three offsites this month. Um, so people are going to see in person, right? Like, I think since we started, we developed so many new techniques, new things, new ways of working to be more productive. So it's constantly improving. I already think we're a lot better than we were before, but I think we're not even as close as productive we're going to be in 10 years. I would say, though, two things are probably worse than in person. One is very cross-functional roles. So roles that depend on aligning with a lot of different stakeholders from a lot of different teams, right? That's still a little bit harder um, than it was in person. Totally. Um, What are some of those roles? Product's a good example. We're getting better now, and I think product has a chance of getting better, but especially early on, you know, like it was really hard. Yeah. Um, The other thing that's worse is junior people. This is an uncracked mystery of COVID, which is if you're 22, you're out of college, a lot of how you learn is going to the office, sitting next to the person and then teaching you all the time. And honestly, a lot of the reason that a lot of people are more productive is because they don't have to do that. Um, But also you don't get to train this next generation, right? In a meaningful way. And I think businesses that have that as a very big part of their culture. So if you look at banking, Um, or private equity, right? Like a lot of of these companies, they training the young people to stay for a long period of time. That's how you build the talent. That's how everyone got there. That is much, much harder remote. I don't think anyone figured that out. For Breck specifically, it's not huge for us. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I graduated in June and I just watched so many of my friends struggle with that, where it's like, instead of just being able to tap someone on the shoulder and ask a quick question, you have to like send a Slack message and word it. And so it just, I think ultimately it just prevents as much free flowing learning and curiosity and questions. I think people sort of are definitely like some of my friends were flailing and their companies didn't really have like that organized of, you know, ways to onboard them remotely. So it was a bit of a mess, but I mean, that's a good area for someone to figure out, you know, Absolutely. really how to it's make that better. Huge, huge, huge opportunity. Um, and, but you know, like everything has pros and cons, right? Like the pro is again, the more senior people are less interrupted and they spend more time being productive and, and, and all that. Right. Yeah, definitely. That's true. I've never thought about that. Um, so this, this next chapter of the interview, I want to just ask you some, you know, personal insights and reflections. Um, My first question for you is, I've heard you talk about best case scenarios before, and I imagine that 10 year old Enrique would look at you now and think you're pretty cool. So I'm curious, how does it feel to reach your own best case scenario? You know, obviously, I always say it is like, I wouldn't say that we're our past or wildest dreams because, you know, we were pretty ambitious early on. It was just a lot faster than we expected. I guess that's what, um, what it is, but I think one thing that changed a lot for me, and it's also true by this stage of the company is before I was very anxious to get to certain milestones. You know, I want to build a billion dollar company. I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. Like I want to get to these milestones and, and right. And and maybe that was important for early on, but right now, you know, the important thing is longevity is like, a lot of founders and a lot of companies after they get big and you know people get successful they get rich they just they just lose their edge right they start settling down they you know start pacing down and the, the, the constant battle is like how do you keep your edge how do you keep the sense of urgency how do you keep that fire awake and for me um that is i would say what i focus the most today is like how to build a life that allows me to do this for 20 plus years with the same energy that I had on day one. Um, and, you know, that's like a different set of optimizations than how do you get the fastest to some, some, some milestone. So where do you think this innate 
desire to build a massive business came from? Was it from your parents? Was it wanting something different than what you grew up with? Or where do you, where do you think that stemmed from? I think kind of like I was telling in the beginning of the interview, you know, getting into Enrique psychology here, but like I had this, um, uh, I had this online world, right? And like, yeah. you know, I wasn't super good at school. So I thought I was smart, but just no one around me really like agreed with me, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, so it was this thing in which like, I felt I really wanted to prove to the world that like, you know, I, I was smart and I could do it and, and, and all that. So I was very anxious to get the proof points. So my parents, my friends, my peers, my family, like everyone believed that I was doing something that mattered, that this coding and computers thing because, you know, remember, we're in the middle of Brazil, right? So it's not like um, we're in Silicon Valley and everyone knows Zuckerberg's story. You know, we're in the middle of Brazil. So I just wanted people to believe that this coding thing was like a real thing, you know, and that it, it could be a career. And like, you know, and I I could go to college, but I didn't need to go to college. Right. And I didn't need to become a doctor or an engineer. Um, I think a lot of the anxiety came from that. And were your parents on board with that vision of yours? Like when you when you stopped out of Stanford, which became a dropout of Stanford? Well, at the Stanford point, they were already like, you know, gave up, but like, you I do already, you. Yeah. yeah, you do you. But like I, when I was growing up, it was really hard. I get, I got emancipated when I was 16 and, mm. um, you know, it was, it was not a super easy time with the parents, but I get it. Like, you know, there's no manual of like, how do you deal with your 15 year old kid that wants to drop out of school and start a company? There's like no book for that. Right. So my parents, I guess, just try to protect me. Do you think like with your own kids, you would you would be totally supportive of them taking a similar path of you if, if that's what they wanted. Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, I feel I'm going to be a very low pressure parent. Yeah. You know, maybe that yields good results. Maybe that doesn't, but I think like being a CEO, the most important thing as a parent, just being very authentic. I guess CEO and parenting maybe has some similar, similar aspects. Um, yeah. So you're 26 now. And let's say that, you know, knock on wood, we all live till 126. Like, what do you see as the next few chapters of your life? Like, do you think Brex is what you'll be working on for a very long time? How are you viewing that? Short sure, answer is yes. And I think the that's why I come back to the point of like, I actively and intensely think, how do I make Brex the company and my life the life I want to live for the next many, many years, right? Yeah. Um, and honestly, that was a part of remote, right? And remote decision. I felt that I could just work at Brex for a lot longer. The company was remote. And that was part of the decision making. And, you know, we're not afraid of saying it. Um, and, and like to avoid that, that founder burnout, where it's like maybe someone works for five years or 10 years so hardcore, and then they just want to chill. Like to avoid that, where you can just spend decades building out this business. Do you have any advice for other founders? Because I think there's this like, you know, version of being a young founder that a lot of people experience where it's just sort of prevents you from having any normal version of your 20s. And you have to want that more than every other thing. Yeah. Um, I don't think balance is the right word um, necessarily. I think mm. that, you know, not that we don't have balance. I think I do for me. But like, I think the important thing is, is not the hours that you're not at work is the hours that you are at work. Um, I think that's what burns you out. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, we had a coach, Matt Machari wrote a book. I think it's really good. And he says something, and you know, we agree, my Pedro and I, we agree probably 80% with it. I think there's 20% that, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard, but like, I think most of your time, you should be in what we call your zone of genius. That are things that you like doing and you're productive doing. Um, because if you, most of your time you're doing at work things that you like doing and you're good at doing, you just feel very fulfilled every day. You wake up every morning wanting to do that work. Mm -hmm. And for everything that you don't like, there is someone in the world that likes to do that. And you know, the example I like to give is, um, you know, for example, I hate filling forms. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I hate it, like I just hate it. My fiance, Laura, for some bizarre reason, she loves filling forms. Um, so every time we get a form, she will ask to fill my form independently of me asking. Yeah. Um, so remember this, like for everything in the world, you know, there's like someone who loves that job. So keep the things that you are good at and you love doing and like try to hire people and compliment you and the things that you don't like doing. And look, this is only possible 
to an extent. It's not possible 100%, yeah. but I think if you strive for that, you're going to be a lot more fulfilled and you can go for a lot longer. Totally. I think that's really wise, like optimize for loving what you do. Of course, it's never going to be 100% anything in life. There'll be elements you don't like, but um, yeah, it's true. People's brains work so differently. Some people find a lot of comfort in there being one clear goal, like filling out a form, for example, and that's so satisfying. And for some people it's, it's like, you know, nails on a chalkboard for them. It just feels, it feels horrible. Um, it goes back to the point of being authentic, right? Like, remember you, you see me and like, I like doing these external things and you're like, I would hate to do that. Like, so like, don't, you know, like, um, there's so many, you know, like if you look at Uber, for example, uh, Emil Michael was his chief business officer. He did all the, a lot of the fundraising and all the external stuff and it worked great, you know, like, so I, I, this, I just can't stress enough this point about just being very authentic to yourself. Definitely. And I think that also you're touching on the idea of surrounding yourself with people that love the things you don't love. Like, so you and Pedro are sort of this like great puzzle piece where you can take on different parts of the business and, and feel really, you know, great yeah. at your respective focus. And then, um, one thing just to add yeah. there, I think is just uh, a point I want to make very clearly. I hope founders, well, you know, it's not super strategic, but I hope founders listen, listen to this, but like do whatever it takes to get the best people to compliment you. Don't be cheap. Um, pay your people well, give them enough equity to get them in. Like one good person can make a massive difference in the success of your company. Don't like, you know, nickel and dime and, and, you know, and try to like get every penny out of people, be fair, be generous, and people will be fair and generous to you. And you get to live your best life and have people on their team who are living their best life. And you can go a lot further together. Um, so I think that's something I see founders all the time, just like, oh, I have this person, but they want too much money or they want too much this or this kind of like, figure it out, get the best people, bring the people that will help you get to that. And did you, I mean, I've heard you, you really, really believe in this and you act on it. And it seems like, you know, to get the right person, you'll, you'll do whatever it takes. Um, did you always know to do that? Like, cause yeah, you're right. I don't think that's how every startup thinks, especially because it's very hard for startups to compete with these huge tech companies like Google and Facebook that like, especially out of college kind of offer salaries to these young people that, you know, most startups just can't compete with. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, we didn't. We did this wrong. This was one of the biggest mistakes in our first company. We like Nickel and I so much. We left so many amazing people. I think what I would say is like one remote helps a ton. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think before I would agree with you that, look, you're in San Francisco. There's only so many engineers, you know, now there's a whole world. There's literally yeah. a whole world of engineers um, that in so many, so many places that never had an opportunity to work for a cool startup. Um, so I think that's like one thing. And then the second thing is. And are you guys hiring a lot of engineers um, from like, you know, abroad and internationally? Ton of people. Yeah. I mean, it also probably makes a lot more sense, you know, financially. Yeah, and like there's just do. not enough good engineers in the US right now. Yeah, we, you know, we do it because of, we just want to find great engineers wherever they are, right? Like, you know, obviously financially, um, especially if you go out of the country, it helps. But, you know, the main reason is just, we just want to find great people wherever they are. Yeah. And as a startup, you have equity. Big companies don't have equity, right? Like, you know, like if someone joins Brex, you know, hey, Brex can be a 10x, right? We can go from 12 billion to 120 billion. I'll be very happy with that outcome if that happened in five years, you know, like very, very happy with that outcome. Um, but like if you join a startup that's, you know, $20 million, that thing can go 1000x, right? Like totally. um, it's so there's a there's a value in being in an early stage company that if you want that level of risk, that's the edge and you need to find people who want that. And that's the unique thing you can get. It's hard Definitely. for me to promise that, you know, a thousand X of Brex at this point, that would be a really big company. Um, but, you know, if you're starting a company that you do have that. Yeah. So you have to like get people to believe in your vision early on and take that risk with you. And inherently it'll probably make them, you know, more invested in the mission. Um, I have a question that I was very curious about. I feel like you are probably used to being the youngest person in a lot of the rooms you're in. And pro especially in your journey, building Brax and building Pagarme, um, I gu I'm guessing you don't get intimidated by a lot of people or a lot of situations, but was there ever a situation just to bring you back down to earth, sort of like where you're really nervous to meet someone or someone really intimidated you or do something? Yeah. Um, 
I guess uh, once we got, when we were six, 17, uh, one of our big mentors, George Paolo, he, he's friends with Bill Gates and he introduced us to Bill Gates. And that was very stressful before meeting him. Oh, wow. was very, it was like <laughs> my idol growing up, you know? And, yeah. Um, and it was one of the reasons that we decided to sell a company and, and come to Stanford. It's, he advised us to do so. Um, Definitely. And you've joined the club of, a, of amazing, you know, Stanford dropouts or college dropouts that have, you know, built big businesses. Um, so I want to ask you a few questions that we like to ask every guest coming on the show. Um, because I think in like mainstream media, there can be a lot of negativity and hate around tech sort of and like it feels like we're losing our humanity or we're going to be living through screens in the metaverse and it's sometimes unclear you know how it's making our lives better but beyond just tech or not tech I'm curious like why are you optimistic for the future and why are you excited about it you know like I think that people that don't get excited about a world of VR are in a bubble, because if you ask any Brazilian in anywhere, if they want to go to VR and, you know, go through Paris um, and be able to see everything, they're going to be like, yes, you know, like, that's my dream. Like, I, I cannot afford to go to Paris, but like, this is like the second best thing. Um, so I think that I'm extremely optimistic because I believe technology, obviously it enhances the life of the bubble a little bit, you know, in us, the that the people in, in California or New York or some of the, you know, the rich places in the world, mm -hmm. but the impact that it has in, you know, a lot of developing countries and a lot of other places around the world is insurmountable. Think about, it. I met my co-founder over Twitter, you know, who says yeah. Twitter is useless? Like it changed my life. Wow. I met the guy who introduced me to Stanford to Facebook groups, you know, um, and it changed my life completely. Like the amount that the connectivity of the internet and the world has increased and allowed for, I learned how to code online, right? Like there's so many things that at least for me were so impactful and changed my life so much and allowed me to be able to come from like, you know, like the middle of the state of Sao Paulo, you know, like to Silicon Valley and that wouldn't be possible without technology. So I can even imagine what that's going to look like, you know, in the metaverse or in the future and what new possibilities that's going to allow um, people all around the world. Definitely. Yeah, that's it's so true. I, I even think people like in Silicon Valley, or especially in the U.S., like don't always have that view and understanding of actually how many lives it can change everywhere and the connectivity it offers, even what Facebook offered to people. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Maybe there'll be a Brex bank in the in the Web3 world soon and we'll we'll go and get help. <laughs> I think that's an amazing place to, to end today. It's been really amazing to speak to you, Enrique. And um, I'm very excited about the future of Brex and to watch you as a founder continue to just grow and build and create. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. You had very insightful questions. Ah, uh, thank you. Oh, 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 oh,